have a song that the angels can't sing. You save my weary soul from all my sin and pain and suffering. A song of the redeemed I once was lost, but you found me. Oh, I have a song that the angels can't sing. I have a song that the angels can't sing. You stepped out of your throne all wrapped in flesh and made yourself like me. A song of a righteousness I couldn't reach, so you reached me. Oh, I have a song that the angels can't sing. like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, and now I see. Now I have a song that the angels can't sing. Oh, I have a song that the angels can't sing.
gonna be alright And the voice that calmed the raging sea Is calling you his child So be still and know he's in control
Good morning. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Uh, this first song we're going to sing is called uh, In Christ Alone. And in this song, it talks about, in the first verse, it talks about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. So he is the, the foundation of our faith. And, and what that means is that if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and if you have Jesus Christ, you have a sure foundation. We know the Bible talks about a story of a house on the sand and a house on the rock, and what a difference that can make for that house and, and our life being that house. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. He is our foundation. I hope that as we stand together and that as we worship together, that we can think about what Christ has done in our lives and that it would prepare our hearts for the message today. Would you stand with us as we sing? In Christ alone. singing I was thinking that 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 one part in the song at the end it said uh, no one can ever pluck us from his hand and this song Jesus Christ is talking about what he did on the cross for us 
And it's what he's done in, in his sacrifice and his bloodshed, what he's done for us. But what he's also done for us is made sure that as we accept that salvation that he offers, that nothing and no one can take us from his hand. And nothing can remove your name out of the book of life. God says you are secure, and he has, he has, he has made it so that nothing can remove us. Let's sing this next song, What He's Done. for what he's done. We're going to sing. Let me take a look here. I forgot. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And uh, as we know, the Bible says, for without the, re the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It was necessary. And something that's interesting about uh, Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross is that, you know, love to us, I think, is a lot different than God's love. You know, we our, our love is so shallow you know um it can be and i'm not saying these aren't good things or else i'm gonna have a lot of ladies mad at me you know uh, love can be uh roses to your spouse or your significant other love can be a kind note and things like that but love to god was a crucified savior 
love to God was broken bones and pulled out beard and a crown of thorns. And love to God is so much more than a love that you and I could ever show and so much more than a love that you and I could ever convey. And so as we sing this song, let's think about thanking God for that blood.
darkness into glorious Yeah, can you hear me now? All right, there we go. Um, but anyways, it's good to see you. Hope you had a good week. I'll go through the whole thing. Yet. No, I won't. Uh, ushers, would you come forward, please? We'll receive the tithes and offerings of God's people. Don't ever lose sight of the fact. So important. God loves what? A cheerful giver. God tells us not to give begrudgingly, but give with a thankful, thankful heart. Hey, listen, has God been good? Amen. Yeah, that's not a psychology speech before the offering, all right? It's true. God is good, and I'm so thankful uh, how he meets our needs and how he meets the needs of the local New Testament church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much, Lord, for meeting our needs. Lord, I just taught a Sunday school lesson in here this morning about worry. And Lord, how we shouldn't worry. Why? Because you clothe the grass of the field. You feed the fowls of the air. And Lord, we're much better than the fowls of the air and the lilies of the field. Thank you so much for meeting our needs. Thank you so much that we don't have to worry, uh, Lord. And we praise you for that. Lord, we pray for this offering time. We thank you for the meeting the needs of your local church through your people. Lord, I pray that you'll again, uh, for another week, meet our needs through uh, the faithfulness of your people. I pray that you'll bless the gift, the giver. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Kings, First King, uh, chapter number 18. Last week, of course, we concluded Vacation Bible School and uh, had a wonderful service last week, had a lot of visitors. Uh, we have visitors again here today, praise the Lord. And um, so we talked about Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know about you, but that helped give me some clarity and help remind me what a great God we serve, what a great Savior we have. And uh, let me say this, I know you know it, but I'll say it anyways. If you ever miss a Sunday, 
Obviously, you can um, catch the link. Usually, most people do it through Facebook, but there's other ways to do it. You can talk to Travis about that. Um, but if you ever miss a Sunday, uh, you can be with us without being with us, and that's one blessing about technology. And, of course, you can always go back um, our church Facebook page. You can go back and watch any, any Sunday uh, that you want to. Wednesday, every Wednesday, I, um, I put a video. Um, I video um, a, a lesson, uh, in, usually in my office, and I post it uh, sometime Wednesday, uh, most of the time Wednesday evening. And um, we're just concluding the book of Genesis. We're just concluding um, different characters. Uh, right now we're finishing with Joseph, and then I'm going to be starting a new series. Um, but s same thing, you can watch it whenever, whenever you're able uh, to watch it. And so uh, use, use the technology that we have. It's, it is helpful. Some things technology is bad. Some things are hurtful. Sometimes it's very helpful. This is one of the cases um, that is very uh, helpful. All righty. Uh, First Kings chapter 18. We're going to talk about I our theme for the year, of course, is identity. And for the most part, uh, like last week, we kind of uh, change that, but uh, most of my messages so far in two, 2022 have been about identity. Uh, God said, therefore, if any man or any person be in Christ, he is a new what? Creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things what? I become new. We've been created new, been given a new life, new birth, in Christ Jesus, so we have an identity, and our identity, our identity is very, very important as far as reaching the lost, as far as uh, being strong in our faith. And today we're going to contrast two different servants, okay? And so we're going to look at our identity this morning as a servant. Maybe draw a little circle around yourself as always. And uh, some, you know, why is it always easier to draw a circle around somebody else? Isn't that the way it is? Uh, boy, I hope they're catching this message. I hope, I hope they got this one. Uh, no, no. Uh, draw a little circle around yourself and say, Lord, what kind of servant am I? And, uh, and Lord, the Lord will help us be the type of servant that God wants us to be. Two different types of servants in the text this morning. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 18, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. Now, do you remember three years prior to this? Elijah went before Ahab and he said, it's not going to rain, but according to my word, it's not going to rain. And I'm sure Ahab thought, yeah, whatever, you religious nut. But God said, Elijah, you better hide. Because not too long from now, after it hasn't rained for a while, he's going to come looking for you. So God had Elijah go hide. Now, do you know the first place, the first place he went to hide? How many of you know where he told him to go hide? He told him to go hide where? By the brook Cherith. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. You ever, you ever hear the story how the ravens brought him food and he drank the water out of the brook. But let me tell you what happened. What happened to the brook? It dried up. Hey, have you ever thought you were right in the middle of the will of God? Obeying God? Doing what God wanted you to do and the brook still dried up. That's not the sermon, but it's a wonderful, wonderful thought. And you know what? The brook dried up. So he said, I want you to go hide in a second place. Do you know where he went? There was a widow in Zarephath. And this widow, God said, I've told this widow to feed you. Hey, this great prophet of God went from being fed from ravens to a widow. And we're not going to get into what that meant. But uh, a widow feeding Elijah, the man of God. Yep. Well, he goes and he finds this widow. She's gathering, what, two sticks. She said, I'm going to eat this little bit of meal that I have. And we're going to eat this uh, little, one last supper. And Elijah said, make me a little cake first. 
Well, she did. And the Bible says they ate many days. And those are the places we know Elijah was during those three years. Now, three years later, here we have it again. It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. Now, remember, it hadn't rained in three years. I mean, it was bad. It was terrible. People were dying. Animals were dying. It was really bad. And he said, go show yourself to Ahab. I'm going to send rain. I'm going to send rain after three years. Verse number two, and Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria. Now here we have the second servant. Elijah is the first servant we're going to look at. And then it said, and Ahab called Obadiah. Obadiah was a friend of Elijah's. But he was serving Ahab. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord. He feared the Lord greatly, the Bible says. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll help us this morning just to draw that little circle, as we say so often around ourselves. Help us to evaluate our hearts and what kind of servant we are, Lord, more like Elijah or perhaps more like Obadiah, maybe somewhere in between. Speak to our hearts, please. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Elijah was made into what he was, partly because of the trials. By the way, trials of life are never fun, but they help make us who we are. And so no doubt, Elijah would not have been the person that called fire down from heaven. If it wouldn't have been for those two stories I just mentioned, the time that he spent at that brook with those ravens bringing him food every day, and the time he spent with that widow and her son, uh, of course, as, as the meal didn't run out until the rain came. And so now, three years later, again, he's supposed to go see Ahab again. Now, in our text this morning, uh, uh, Elijah obviously is a faithful faithful servant. Obadiah is more of what we would call, and what Jesus called, was a hireling. Uh, just somebody that did what he did um, uh, for various reasons, and we're going to look at that. And you know, unfortunately, sometimes in the work of God, um, there are a lot of Obadiahs, not bad people, but yet people that just really aren't committed and sold out to God. They know God, and it says here, let's look at another scripture in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 5, uh, having a form of godliness, but denying what? The power thereof. And that was the difference between Elijah and Obadiah, right? They both had a form of godliness, but that the difference was the power of God being evident in their lives. And so we're going to look at this. Uh, first, let's look at Elijah. And it's almost like a little Bible study type thing, a little different maybe than a normal, what you might call what would be a normal Sunday morning service. Um, but Elijah's surrendered service. Elijah was totally surrendered to God. Who else would go before Ahab? Now, the Bible tells us that Ahab was the worst king as far as evil, ruthless. He was the worst, most evil king, the Bible teaches us, that Israel ever had. And he had a wife that was perhaps even more ruthless than him. And his na her name we know to be Jezebel. And they were scary people, let me tell you. But you know, Elijah was told, go to Ahab. And you tell him it's not going to rain. There's a judgment of God for three years. And he said, yes, sir, God, and he did it. Why? Well, let's look at our outline this morning. He had a commander, Elijah's commander. Who was Elijah's commander? I think we know, obviously, who it was. It was God. It was God. God said, Elijah, I want you to go tell him it's not going to rain. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Elijah, I want you to go to this brook. Yes, sir. Elijah, I want you to leave this brook, go to the widow, and she's going to feed you. Yes, sir. Three years later, Elijah... Now I want you to go 
back to Ahab and tell him it's going to rain. So we see Elijah's commander. It's God. Now realize this. Um, even though God's our commander, we're going to go through trouble. Hello. Let me ask you, have you gone through trouble lately? You don't have to go looking for trouble, do you? Many times, most of the time, trouble comes looking for us. And boy, you know what? When we find ourselves going through trouble, what a wonderful thing it is to have the right commander. Hey, to have God, what we might call calling the shots. To have God leading us. Very important. And we know the Bible says in the 23rd Psalm, he leads us beside what? The still waters, not stormy waters, even though we go through the storm sometimes. He leads us to the what kind of pastures? Green pastures, even though many times we face uh, drought <laughs> pastures. Realize this. Look at the statement with me. We can allow the trials to bring us closer to our commander, closer to God, or we can allow the trials of life to drive us further away from God. And you know, Elijah did not allow those things to keep him from obeying the commander. And so that's our next thought. Let me ask you first of all, before we go to the next point, who is your commander? I mean, who is the person calling the shots in your life? Um, and then we see not only Elijah's commander, who was God, we see the command. And I've already touched on that. He told Elijah many commands. And you know what we see? Every time God gave him a command, he said what? I'll do it. I'll do it. And here in our text in verse number one, it came to pass after many days that, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go you show yourself to Ahab. And again, it wasn't easy because Ahab's not in a good mood. Jezebel has already been um, attacking the prophets of God. She did not like God. She had Baal. She was a Baal worshiper, right? And so it wasn't an easy, an easy thing to do. Why? Famine was in the land for three years. I mean, Ahab was not uh, good to begin with. Now he was doubly bad. I mean, he was upset because of this rain, and he was blaming Elijah. That's who he was blaming. So we see the command, go show yourself, Elijah. I know you've been hiding out for three years. Now it's time to go show yourself. Sometimes I think we read these Bible stories and we don't really understand the fear. Because we know the end of the story. Elijah didn't. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he trusted the command. He trusted the commander. I mentioned in my Sunday school class probably two or three times, Proverbs 3, 5, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You won't see it on the screen. But trust in the Lord with what? With all your heart. And lean not, what? To your own understanding. That's hard to do. It's easier said than done sometimes. Let's look at the statement together. There are times when God's commands just don't make sense. From a human perspective. Well how about if I just send him an email God? <laughs> well, How about if I just send him a letter? You know? How about if I send somebody else? But God says no you do it. And sometimes when God tells us to do something we're a little afraid. Right? Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But we just do it. I like, the, I like the saying, if God be for us, what? Who can be against us? Which leads us to the next thought. Elijah's comfort. You know there's a certain comfort following the will of God. I heard someone say one time, the safest place you'll ever be is in the will of God. Even if that place is a burning, fiery furnace where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves, they were in the will of God. The safest place they could have been is in the midst of that burning, fiery furnace because they were obeying God. 
You know the safest place for Daniel to be was in that lion's den. I'm sure it wasn't comfortable. But it was the safest place for him to be. Why? Because he was following the purpose and the plan that God had for his life. And I want you to notice in verse number one, it came to pass after many days, I know this is like the third time we've read it, that the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. How many of you know the story of Jonah? God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach, they need to be saved. Jonah said, I don't feel led to go to Nineveh. And he fled. Found himself in the belly of a ship going to Tarshish. And you know the story? He ended up being thrown overboard. God prepared a fish to swallow him up. He was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in that fish's belly, that whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Right? And the Bible says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time and said, go to Nineveh that great city, and preach against it. Guess what? He said, I think I'll go. (laughs) Hey, you know what? Before we can get too hard on Jonah, how about me? How about you? Do we do everything God tells us to do? No. We'd be better off. We'd have more comfort if we did what God wanted us to do. You know, even though Elijah was in a scary situation, he could still find comfort. Why? Because he was following the Lord. Following the Lord. Following the shepherd. Now remember in John, John chapter number 10, you won't see it on the screen, but John chapter number 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Man, you follow after the good shepherd, you're not going to go wrong. You're going to find comfort. You're going to find still waters for the most part. Doesn't mean some won't be stormy. You're going to find green pastures for the most part. That doesn't mean that there won't be some famine in your life. But the bottom line is we can find comfort. The word of the Lord was a comfort to Elijah. Why? Because he was doing what God wanted him to do. And again, it doesn't always make sense. Doesn't always make sense. Uh, Doing a, doing a major remodel job in a country church in the middle of nowhere is not always the wisest thing to do, you know? But you feel like, hey, this is what God wants us to do. Even though it doesn't make sense, right? What in the world are you doing knocking down walls and doing all this stuff? Don't you know we're in a pandemic? Don't you know this? Don't you know this? But what do you do? You just follow the Lord. And you follow the Lord and God will help you through it. Let's look at this together. God's commands are always accompanied by God's provisions. Hello. God's commands are always accomplished by God's provisions. We don't have time to get into Abraham, how God provided. Do you remember when he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac? Take him up there on that hill and offer him a sacrifice. Little Isaac said, Dad, we have the fire, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the lamb? And he said, God will provide a lamb for us. You know the story. Jehovah Jireh, God provided a lamb for that sacrifice. And folks, listen to me. You follow God, right? Keep him as your commander. You obey his commands. And listen, you'll find comfort realizing trust in the Lord with all your heart. Follow him. Do what he wants you to do. And God's commands are always accompanied by God's provisions. God's going to take care of it. And again, Elijah's compliance. Elijah's compliance. Everything God told him to do, he did it. Now, we're not going to get into the story, but later on, God told him to build an altar. God told him to pour water. Dig a trench around that altar. Huh? That doesn't make sense. 
but he dug a trench. And then he said, take some water and drench it. Now, mind you, it hadn't rained for three years. What was that water worth? Can you imagine people saying, what are you, nuts? What in the world are you doing? Pouring that water on that altar. But he did everything God told him to do. And then guess what? He called on God. God, I've done everything you've told me to do. Now it's up to you. And the Bible says fire fell. You know, so many times we wonder why God isn't doing. I, I've experienced that. Why, God? Why aren't you doing? You know, I think many times God would say to us, well, what, what, what are you doing? Are you doing what I want you to do? Are you being obedient? How many of you have children? Well, when your children are just being very, very terrible and disobedient, and then they hold their hand out, and you say, what? What are you? No, you straighten up first, right? No, you go clean that bedroom first like I told you to, and then we'll go get an ice cream. Well, at least that's what you should do as a parent. Now, we don't always do that, do we? Uh, hello, now be honest, do we? Sometimes you just get it so they'll shut up, you know? Um, I've been there. But guess what? If you do that all the time, if you do that all the time, just give it to them so they'll shut up. They're going to get out in that world and find out that's not how the world works. Right? It really isn't. But anyways, his compliance. You know what? It revealed he had a heart for God. Elijah had a heart for the Lord. Even during terrible leadership, Hello, America. Even in the middle of famine, even in the middle of high inflation, even in the middle of all kinds of bad things, he still obeyed the Lord. He still followed the Lord. What a lesson for us, right? Did we love the Lord enough to obey him? Did we trust the Lord enough to obey him. Look at this statement with me. Nothing reveals the truth of our love for God any more clearly than our obedience for him. And that's putting the rubber where it meets the road, right? Lip service. A lot of us have. I mean, I have lip service sometimes, right? But God doesn't want to just, just have <clears throat> lip service. He wants us to obey him. And that's the kind of servant that Elijah was. Now let's flip the page. Obadiah. Obadiah knew God. We already read the verse. As a matter of fact, he feared God. Let's look at it again. Verse 3. Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. You know what that word governor means? It means he had control over all his house, just like Joseph did in Potiphar's house. Joseph had complete control in Potiphar's house. He was trusted by Potiphar. He was the governor of Potiphar's house. Now we have Obadiah. Obadiah is the governor of Ahab's house. How could he, fearing God greatly, work not only work for, but oversee all the terrible, terrible things that Ahab and Jezebel did. We know one thing they did. Do you remember when Ahab wanted that vineyard? He wanted the vineyard that was right next to the palace. Does anybody know, see if I have a dollar, does anybody know the name of the man that owned the vineyard? Naboth. Naboth. Naboth said, it's not for sale. This has been in my family for generations. And you know what they ended up doing to Naboth, don't you? They did away with Naboth and they just took it. That's the kind of people they were, ruthless people. And here we have Obadiah. He wasn't a faithful servant like Elijah was. He was more of a secret servant. He was a governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He was saved. 
For it was so, verse 4, this is one good thing he did when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Wow. So he's not a total bad guy here. I mean, he took a hundred prophets and hid them and fed them, fed them. And verse number five, and Ahab said to Obadiah, go into the land unto all the fountains of the water and unto all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive. That's how desperate they were. Had rain for three years. There was no grass. Hey, we need to keep the horses alive. We need to keep the mules alive. That we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. And Ahab went one way by himself. And Obadiah went another way by himself. So here he is out looking for, for water. Here he is out looking for grass. And as God would have it, guess what happens? He meets Elijah in the way. So Ab Obadiah, his supreme master, was not God. His commander was not God. His commander was who? Ahab. And you know, we have to come to the point in our Christian lives. We need to ask ourselves, hey, who am I serving? What am I serving? Am I serving? Do I have the wrong master? While Elijah, look at this statement, while Elijah is clearly a servant of God, Obadiah is identified as the governor of Ahab's house. He's identified as a servant of Ahab. He was concerned perhaps more with power than serving God, maybe prosperity. Maybe he knew at least living in this house he would have food and water. He wouldn't have to worry, right? Maybe position. Maybe he just didn't want to give that up. You know, sometimes it's hard to give up position, especially if you, if you, if you worked hard for it. But I don't know what the reason was. All I know is he wasn't really serving God. As a matter of fact, we don't see him serving God at all at this point. We see him serving Ahab, going around looking for, for grass and looking for, for water. And, of course, the application for us is, again, uh, who's your master this morning? Let me read some things because I don't want to leave, leave anything out. Whose will is more important to you? Now, I know this can be convicting, all right? I know it's convicting to me. Whose will is more important to you, God's will or your will? Is it more important for you to please God or to please people or to please yourself? Can you honestly say that you consistently place God before everything and everyone? You say, man, that sounds pretty radical. What's the first commandment? Old Testament and new, by the way. To put God first, right? You should love the Lord God. They said to Jesus, what's a great, uh, trying, to, trying to trip him up, what's a great commandment? Well, the, to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Don't put anything before God. Well, what's the second commandment? Well, people. You love people as you love yourself, right? And so, what are we doing do we place God in his rightful place? We are purchased, right? He bought us with his own blood. He purchased. We're not our own, the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, right? Hey, when, when we have to make a decision, do we consult the master? Do we ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? Obadiah was, uh, Nehemiah was following, Nehemiah, I'll get it right eventually. Elijah was following the voice of God. Obadiah was following the voice of what? Of man, of Ahab. He was doing what Ahab wanted him to do. Hey, uh, when we have to make a decision, we should talk to God about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Then you follow God. God knows my heart. Um, as a pastor, I try to follow God. I try to follow God. And sometimes it comes with some cost, too. I'm telling you that right now. 
And I, I, but you, you try to follow God. That's what you do. And I encourage you, hey, follow God. Again, doesn't mean you're not going to have any storms. Doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems, no. But you know what it does mean? That you're following the one that made you, created you. You follow the one that is able to do anything. And wow, that's the greatest thing that we can, we can do. Let's look at this um, uh, Obadiah's secret. He had a secret. Even living in the house of of Ahab. The Bible says he did fear the Lord greatly. And that's, that's saying something. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. And it's also the beginning of what? Wisdom. So that's a good thing to fear the Lord. The Bible tells us about another good thing. We're not going to read the verse, Travis. But he tells us about another good thing. He, at one time, when this started, he took those hundred prophets and hid them in 50 apiece in caves and fed them water, took care of them. Man, that's pretty noble. But you know what? Obadiah still had a problem. What was it? Let's look at it. Obadiah chose to live his life somewhere between God and the world. He couldn't figure out. And by the way, before we throw stones at Obadiah, have we ever been there? Reminds me of one of those robots, you know, uh, uh, on Star Wars. But that's what we do. And we do that. Jesus warned us, Matthew 6, let's look at it. No man can serve what? It's not up there yet, but it's coming. Matthew chapter number 6. No man can serve what? Two masters. Why is that? For he either he'll hate the one... Or what? And love the other or else hold to the one that despise the other. You cannot serve God, what? And ma'am, and that's money, of course. But, but Obadiah was conflicted. And we have to be careful we get conflicted. Um, and, and, and God, uh, again, Obadiah was following the voice of Ahab. What did Ahab tell him to do? And look at verse 5 with me. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all the fountains of the water, all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the bees. So they divided the land. And once again, he's following Ahab. Hey, he was employed by the wrong people. He was engaged in the wrong activity. He's putting horses and mules before people. putting horses and mules before people. Hey, as servants of God, let's be reminded our most important thing is what? It's people. We just had vacation Bible school. Many of you work very hard, okay? Very hard. And guess what? Those children came. Several of them were saved. Many parents last week. People, right? Well, I just passed out the clipboard. Well, Carbon County Fair. Let's get the word out. Invite, invite people. Give them a little invite card that has a gospel on the back. People. We've been blessed with nice facilities, beautiful gymnasium, right? We just got a brand new coffee shop, man, which is creating some little coffee shop problems. We'll talk about that during announcements, all right? But we've been blessed. But let's never lose sight of the fact what it's about. People. People. Little boys, little girls, people without Jesus. When we forget that, we'll become a church. We'll, we'll fight about the carpeting. We'll fight about the color of the walls. We'll fight about the landscaping. We'll fight about money. We'll fight about everything. That's what we'll do. Because we're soldiers. Do you know that you're a soldier? In God's army? So if soldiers are not fighting the enemy, what do soldiers do? They fight each other. That's what they do. 
So if we lose sight of the fact that it's about people, and that's what you have. Yeah, do you hear this? Yeah, I want you to pray for them. Just letting you know. And that's what we do. We just do this. We pick at each other. We bite each other. We devour each other. And that's important to remember. Uh, Obadiah was mostly just cared about his own self. Let's look at it. I'm skipping some stuff, Travis. Bear with me. Let's look at 1 Kings 18, verse 7. 1 Kings 18. As Obadiah was in the way, right? He was looking for that water, looking for some grass for the horses. Behold, Elijah met him. Wow. Talk about being punched right in the kisser. Whoa, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. Have you ever gone through life and God just punches you in the kisser? And says, man, thanks, I needed that, really. But man, I wasn't expecting that. And here we have Elijah. He met him and he knew him. Obadiah knew him and he fell on his face and said, art thou my Lord Elijah? It's been a few years. Is that you, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. I am. And just like Elijah was on his way to find Ahab, and here's Ahab out looking for water himself. And Elijah says this, I want you to help me out. Go find your master. Ooh. Wow. Maybe Obadiah was tempted to say, what are you talking about? Ahab's not my master. Yeah, I serve there and everything, but he's not my master. You know how we do. I said we, how we do. Hey, hey, Elijah, what are you talking about? Man, he's not my master. Yeah, I serve there, but he's not my master. He said, go tell your Lord, your master. Behold, Elijah's here. He's out of hiding. Instead of Ahab looking for Elijah, Elijah's now what? Looking for Ahab. And he said, and now look at Obadiah's response. This is, tells us really everything we need to know about Obadiah. What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant? Now he says, I'm your servant, Elijah. What have I done that you'd be so mean to be your servant to send me to that wicked man for him to kill me? Wait a minute now, Obadiah. Don't you live at his house? Yeah. Wait a minute, Obadiah. Don't you serve him? Yeah. Well, wait a minute, Obadiah. Aren't you serving him right now looking for grass and water? Obadiah's putting a pretty nice spin on this whole situation. Hey, what do you want me to get killed? And, he, and we're not going to read the rest of it, Travis. He's arguing with them. But reluctantly, reluctantly, he does. He goes and finds Ahab. And of course, they have a meeting. We're not going to get into that. So just let me encourage you, just a few thoughts about Obadiah. Maybe we find our play, ourselves with a smidgen of Obadiah. Our fears. Our fears. He did fear the Lord, but he feared Ahab more. He feared God, but he feared Ahab more. How about us? Do we fear God? I would dare say the average person in here would say, yeah, what do you think I'm doing here? I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here, right? Yeah, I fear God, and I, I'm glad you do. We, and by the way, we should fear God. There's a crowd out there that tells us God's all, you know, love bubbles and, and roses and but no, we, we need to fear God. God tells us so. And so, hey, you know what? We fear God. But many times, unfortunately, we fear man more. We fear the things of the world more. We fear the devil more. God says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 
And so our fear is out of place. If our fear is out of place, hey, hello, listen. If our fear is out of place, our service is going to be out of place. We're not going to be serving like we should if we're full of fear. Faithless. Obadiah found himself. Now, now listen, there was a time in the past, man, he, he, he hid, hid prophets, he fed them, but that was in the past. Now he was faithless. How about you and me? Boy, in our, in our past, we had charged hell with a squirt gun, so to speak. Man, God told us, man, do this, we'd do it. But that's in the past. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, I know even myself, you live in the past. It's not a good place to live. We should live in the present. Kind of like one of those things, what have you done for me lately? You know, and I think God would say that to us sometimes. What have you, did, what have you done for me uh, lately? And his rationale, again, and this all goes together, his rationale was, hey, you know what? I did this in the past. He told Elijah. He reminded Elijah. Verse 13, way down in the chapter, he said, Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I did this? Hey, wait a minute, Elijah, you got it all wrong. I did this, I did that, I did this. And that's good. And so many times as servants, we say, you know what? I had my day. I did it. I've done it. Now guess what? I can take that plaque. And my dad, I love my dad. And they gave him a plaque, I think, for like 50 years doing something. 50 years of serving. I think uh, children, working in children ministries, 50 years. And he put that, he's got a plaque on his wall, right? But what, are we living just to get a plaque on the wall and say, wow, I did this. I did this. Well, what about today? Hey, it's not that we're not thankful. Boy, I'm thankful for people that built this before I got here, right? And people that bought this land and worked and did and did, thank the Lord. But what are we doing now? What are we doing for the Lord now? Again, two servants, Elijah, right? And I'm not going to go back over it. Or Obadiah, not a bad person, but he's stuck in the past, what he did yesterday, instead of what he's doing now. What are you doing for the Lord now? Well, I'm old. Boy. Or I'm tired. Or I'm, These are all valid excuses, but when it's all said and done, guess what they still are? Excuses. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for conviction, because that means you're still speaking to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that we do feel conviction. Lord, I felt conviction preparing the sermon, getting it ready. Feel conviction preaching it. Lord, I pray that you'll help me to be the servant that you want me to be. Many, many times I may have. But I'm sad to say many, many times I'm Obadiah. Lord, I need your help to be a consistent Ahab. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Lord, I dare, I dare say most of our people feel like that. Lord, what a wonderful experience to be Ahab. And Lord, what an empty feeling to be Obadiah. I pray that you'll help us to look at where we are today. Where am I today? Maybe today we're leaning more towards Obadiah. Help us. Help us to flip that, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll help us speak to our hearts. Lord, there's a lost world to win. There's so much more to do. Our time, our time is short. 
If we really believe that, it's not time to quit. It's time to put the pedal to the metal. Lord, help us. But their heads bowed and their eyes closed. Let me say this, preacher, I, I know this, I'm born again. There was a time in my life I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was on my way to hell. And I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. How many of you have that testimony? Would you slip up your hand, please? Many, many, many hands. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. If you're not sure you're saved, please talk to me before you leave. Meet me, meet me in the lobby. Uh, email me through the church website. I'd love to talk to you about how to be saved. How many of you are honest enough to say, Preacher, I needed this message. I need to be more like Ahab instead of Obadiah. And God spoke to my heart about it. How many of you are humble enough to say, Preacher, would you pray for him? Would you slip up your hand? Man, many, many hands. I know my hand's up too. Lord, help us, please. Help us, Father, to be the servant that you want us to be. The Spirit indeed is willing, just like you told the disciples that night in the garden. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the whole thing of the devil is to keep us out of the battle, keep us out of the fight, to keep us just bickering at one another and a little gossip, a little junk. People are dying and going to hell while we're, we're, we're making phone calls, going out for coffee, chewing on people. Lord, I pray that you'll help us. Help us, Lord, to be the servants you want us to be, to reach more and more people. And Lord, it's not going to happen unless the church is more full of Elijah's than Obadiah's. Help us, please. I pray you bless the invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand your feet, please?